I wanted to talk about number five, the Majumanikaya number five. So I know many of you have these books, but if you don't, they look like this. Um, I mean, there are ways you can find the sutta online, but you might not find the same translation, then it might get quite confusing because most of the translations are from Ajanta Nisavo or sometimes on Sutta Central, Bhante Sajato sort of touches it up here and there, or not. Um, but I like Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, so I'm going to use the text. So I'm going to read through it. I don't know if we'll get right through it, because there'll be things to unpack, things to say. Okay, so Annie says my voice is intermittent, so I'll put my speakers in. Is that true for everybody? No. Sometimes it is though, uh, so I will put them in. I'm recording this on my little device, so uh, just in case people want to listen later. So I'll put them in and see if that makes the sound more consistent. Is that alright? Still hear me? Okay. Alright. So I'll uh, read through and pause in some places to unpack it a bit and also if there are any questions I'll make some pauses so that we can uh, chime in. If there's anything urgent you are welcome to put your hand up. Um, I guess you could even just unmute yourself but um, if you can wait till the end of a paragraph or a place where it's convenient for me to pause that would be good uh, and I will make sure I get some breaks in there. Alright, so, Anangana Sutta, without blemishes. Thus have I heard. <clears throat> On one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove and Nata Pindika's Park. There the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus, let's say, and bhikkhunis thus. And from now on I'll say monastics. Friends. Monastics. Oh, friends, monastics, okay. Friend, they replied. The Venerable Sari Putta said this. Friends, there are these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What for? Here, some person with a blemish does not understand it as it actually is. Thus, I have a blemish in myself. Here, some person with a blemish understands it as it actually is. Thus, I have a blemish in myself. And here, some person with no blemish does not understand it as it actually is. Thus, I have no blemish in myself. And here, the fourth one, some person with no blemish understands it as it actually is. I have no blemish in myself. Okay, I think we already need to pause a little bit, perhaps. Is my voice okay for others? Because Annie's saying it's not... not Good, it might be your computer, Annie. Okay. So, four kinds of persons. So this is quite a common frame of reference that the Buddha uses in the text to point out sort of um, degrees, I guess, of, of development and purification on the path. Um, and then he classifies them in order of which ones are the ones to aspire toward. So the blemish at this point, it's a funny uh, translation, it's a funny word, one that's not commonly used in the suttas, but um, I think this is referring mostly to what we just talked about, the five hindrances. So any kind of defilement in the mind, which can be grouped in, in various ways, it can be grouped as the five hindrances, especially um, because these are the main blemishes or obstacles, if you like, toward uh, deepening our samadhi practice. So it's always one or more of the five hindrances that stop us getting into what's called the jhana states, the very deep states of absorption um, in deep samadhi. That's the eighth factor of the noble path. Um, but blemish also, in some contexts here, could also refer to um, things which block us from the stream entry, right? because this is going through four different kinds of persons at different stages of their development. So those kind of blemishes might be things like doubt, yeah, the doubt about the path because you haven't seen it fully yet, you haven't penetrated the path with right view. Or it could be still not seeing the Four Noble Truths in their entirety, 
right? Because until we do that also, we don't attain to stream winning. And stream winning happens when we do see suffering completely, parinyatam. We see it in its entirety and also its cessation. Yeah. Uh, and what's the other thing blocking us from, uh, from stream entry is like... Um, some belief, some superstitious belief that if we do certain rites or rituals, if we have certain views or ways of behaving, then that in itself will be sufficient to understand the Dhamma. So this was probably something that was a lot more common in the past, in, uh, in particularly religious societies, but even in Western society we can be attached to our views. And one example of that, I mean I'm making this up, but I think one example of that could actually be becoming quite dogmatic about there not being such things as future lives and past lives, or about becoming very dogmatic that there is no real effect of karma, it doesn't really matter, you know, uh, about the quality of our intention, because it doesn't make much difference. That is also a dogma, that is also a view that will prevent us from seeing things as they truly are. So... In the path, we need to keep this open-mindedness, you know, so that we are actually able to see what's arising as it arises. So the person with the blemish understands, I have a blemish in myself. And then there's a person with a blemish who doesn't understand that they have a blemish in themselves. Okay? And then there's a person with no blemish who doesn't understand that they have no blemish, and one who does understand that they have no blemish. So then the Buddha says, this person with a blemish who does not understand it as it actually is, is thus. I have a blemish in myself. Oh, sorry. The person with a blemish who does not understand it as it actually is, I have a blemish in myself, is called the inferior of these two persons with a blemish. Herein, the person with a blemish who understands it as it actually is thus, I have a blemish in myself, is called the superior of these two persons with a blemish. So straight away we're seeing that it's a lot better to actually have these uh, blemishes or stains or uh, hindrances, defilements, if you like, in our mind and be able to accept, be able to know that, be aware of that. It's far better than having those things and yet being in denial or uh, not noticing, not even knowing where our obstacles lie because only if we actually know um, we can do something about it and also I think there's a certain amount of humility in there right? but the other interesting thing in this is that uh, the phrase understanding it as it actually is because that's a phrase that's also used in the context of seeing the Dhamma yoni so manasikara to Oh, sorry, yatabhuta jnana dasana means like to know things as they truly are. So this has to be present on the whole path from the beginning to the end. It's not that there's some kind of ultimate truth, knowing things that as they truly are, um, but we cannot know things in order to get to that. We have to know things as they truly are every step of the way. So the whole path is one of being true to what's arising now and gradually refining that ability to be honest, to be true, um, to know what's happening in our body and mind. Mm -hmm. So I'll just read the next bit, and then I'll open for any comments. So then the Buddha's looking at the two people with no blemish. Sorry, it's Sariputta. Sariputta saying this. Herein, the person with no blemish, who does not understand it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish, is called the inferior of these two persons with no blemish. Herein, the person with no blemish, who understands it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish, is called the superior of these two persons with no blemish. So that's also quite interesting, because we might think that somebody who has a very pure mind, if they're not aware of that, that's quite sweet, that's quite humble, you know, they're just so pure, they don't even know it, isn't that wonderful? And a person who is very pure and who knows they're very pure, in our Western culture we might think that's even arrogant. But here the Buddha's saying, no, it's the opposite. Because you need to, again, know where you are on the path. And it's not a personal thing. It's not like there's this person who is uh, responsible for this. It's more that you're in touch with the reality as it is. And you're able to be very clear about that. Yeah, And one of the signs for um, something like stream entry is that you know if it's happened, right? 
I heard a story the other day by um, one senior monk in, in the Thai forest tradition and it was uh, quite funny, quite cute really, because when he was a young monk he went up to Ajahn Chah and he said, Ajahn Chah, am I a stream winner? <laughs> am I like, have I reached the first stage of enlightenment? And Ajahn Chah just looked at him and said, how should I know that? <laughs> very blunt and he could get away with that kind of thing <laughs> no airs and graces but it's true other people can't really know for us and even if they could what does it matter I mean how is that going to help and I think that the other point that Ajahn Chah was making really is that if you were you'd know right if you were you'd know for yourself you wouldn't need to come and ask me so this is one of the problems we are so eager sometimes to get these kind of attainments that we're not willing to actually take an honest assessment of where we are and what blemishes remain to be removed and then the person with no blemish understands as it actually is I have no blemish they're called the superior persons of the ones with no blemish so of course they, they understand they understand this process and they understand where they are on the path but again, like I say, at this point, there's no sense of self. So at this point, if there's no blemish, this is... It could be a person who has no blemish temporarily. It could be that, you know, you've overcome the hindrances, you've um, managed to get into some deep samadhi states, and at that time, the mind is very pure. You know, especially straight after these states, apparently the hindrances, usually, if it's a real deep jhana, they don't appear for hours and hours, you know, maybe sometimes even days. So that also could be what's referred to here, or it could be a person who's actually removed them forever, you know, who's removed all the kilesas, the defilements forever, the greed, hatred and delusion, and is a fully enlightened arahat. So this is speaking at different levels, different places on the path. So I will pause there and open for any comments or questions. So far, any clarification or any... Uh, it doesn't have to be only about this. It could also be your experience. How does it feel? Do you know? Do you know when there's a defilement in the mind? Or do you sometimes think that oh, my mind's free from the five hindrances now, but there's something subtle there that you're not aware of. Hmm? Nothing, 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 nothing. So then we'll read on. So this is a really nice sutta because I'm not sure how many of you know that Sariputta was the chief disciple of the Buddha, the, the one that he said was basically equal in wisdom to him. And Mahamogalana was the other chief disciple, so he had the left and the right hand disciples. And Samiputta was uh, um, sort of known to be the wisest of all, comparable with the Buddha himself. And Mahamogalana, I mean, is also fully enlightened, so he also has the wisdom, but his speciality was the psychic powers. And uh, they were very close growing up, you know, as lay men, as lay boys. Um, and so now the Venerable Maha Moggallana gets involved. So this is Sariputta and Moggallana now having a discussion. So when this was said, the Venerable Maha Moggallana asked the Venerable Sariputta, Friend Sariputta, what is the cause and reason why of these two persons with a blemish, one is called inferior and one is called superior? What is the cause and reason why of these two persons with no blemish, one is called the inferior and one is called the superior. So they always like to dig deeper together. It's really nice. And they address each other friend. A lot of respect and a lot of affection there. So then Saudi put to answers. Herein, friend, when a person with a blemish does not understand it as it actually is, I have a blemish in myself, it can be expected that they will not arouse zeal make effort or in instigate energy to abandon that blemish and that they will die with lust, hate and delusion, with a blemish, with the mind defiled. So then he gives a lovely simile. Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy, covered with dirt and stains, and the owners neither used it nor had it cleaned, but put it away in a dusty corner. Would the bronze dish get more defiled and stained later on? Yes, friend. 
So too, friend, when a person with a blemish does not understand it as it actually is, I have a blemish in myself, it can be expected that they will not arouse zeal, make effort or instigate energy to abandon that blemish and that they will die with lust, hate and delusion with a blemish with mind defiled. So this is the thing, if we don't see the problem, we put, our, we put it in a corner, in a dusty corner. We let it lie, we let it just settle and kind of, I don't know, it's almost like anything that you don't address in your mind just seems to create momentum inside at an unconscious level. You know, or, or say if you, I mean just a small example, even if you have maybe some, a difficult communication with somebody and something arises that feels like a bit tricky and you don't deal with that then and there, it can tend to go into like resentments that are unresolved because we just ignore them, we put them to one side in this dusty corner as he says here. You know, sometimes people say, oh yeah, well when you said that I let it go, I just let it go. But then they bring it up. The next, you know, in a few months later, they bring it up and you say, oh, I thought you said you let it go. So often I think what we really mean when we say I let it go is we kind of ignored it and we let it fester. And that is part of not recognising, you know, when there is anger and ill will, when there is uh, maybe lust or jealousy or whatever, we actually don't address it. So if we're not aware that we have it, um, we do very little to remove it, right? So when we're aware and we can see the danger in those things, then we're motivated to actually uh, to do something about it. But it also, I think, gives us the courage to face it. And the more we use mindfulness, the more we use the practice to actually uh, address what's happening within ourselves, the more we realize that, wow, even just by becoming aware, these things tend to lose their power over us. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what it's talking about when we just put things away in a dusty corner. Or you even things like distractions. For example, you come home from a day at work and you're really tired and grumpy. and But you just feel awful, you know. So instead of actually going to meditate at that time, you think, I'll just stick the TV on or I'll just like even have a glass of wine. And in a way, again, you're putting that, you know, that uh, blemish <laughs> in a dusty corner. You're just suppressing it. And it will keep on coming back to you again and again. Anything else on that? Anything that anybody would like to say about that? Do you notice yourself doing that? <laughs> Some nods. It's great to notice. Anyway, you can unmute yourself if you wish to. Um, otherwise, shall I keep going? Oh, someone unmuted. Many? Yeah, 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 I, I know for myself it's also sometimes easier to think, okay, it's not a big deal because I've got a lot to do, right, I've got a lot of other things to do and to actually, especially in relationships, to address these things takes quite a bit of time and also sometimes quite a bit of skill because we have to wait until we're you know, until we're calm, until we have a feeling of loving kindness and we've reviewed things honestly. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I think that's very wise. I think, you know, taking that time is like 
allowing that blemish, if you like, to, to fade a little bit, yeah, to lose its power, to just disintegrate a little bit, and then we can mop up the rest <laughs> with that uh, conversation or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it really does seem to indicate the sort of need to be constantly on it, really, you know, to really know the mental states that are arising from moment to moment as best we can. Uh, because, again, it's not actually talking at this point about overcoming the blemish, it's just talking about being aware that you have one, right? Uh, and that that's already a, a massive step. And I think sometimes as meditators it's important to remember that because when we start practicing we see things about ourselves that we didn't know were there and we think, oh my goodness, this meditation's making it worse, you know. <laughs> but it's actually, you always had those patterns, it's just you didn't realise and now it's a step, it's actually progress to become aware of, of what's really happening inside. Yeah. Helen's a cool a cool cucumber. Hi Helen. Is she dropping out? Or am I dropping out? Ha. Huh. You're unmuted but you're not clear. You're very um, echoey, but go ahead, Let's see how it goes. I think your connection might not be uh, very good, Helen. Maybe we'll come back to you? Okay, she's muted again. You want to try again? You've sort of frozen on the screen, so I think your connection's not good. She's now dropped out altogether, I think. Okay, will, uh, is there anybody else who'd like to say something on that? Anna? And Matthias as well? <laughs> Luckily they don't all come at once, right? They're, some of them are there sometimes, other times less. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, they're very, yes. Yes, yes. Luckily there's also a lot of beautiful qualities too. <gasps> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. You're very honest. Matthias, did you want to? Great, yeah, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? I also notice, like, if, for example, I think, oh, that person's really judgmental, then I'm judging them. <laughs> so, so <laughs> it's actually me that's being judgmental. Or, like, sometimes you say, gosh, why are they so angry? You know, <laughs> actually, you're angry that they're angry. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ajahn Chah said something like, um, we have to look at ourselves 95% of the time and others a max of five. But really, I think, you know, even that 5%, it's only just so you can navigate the world, like you have to know who's in front of you, right? And if there's any danger or whatever. But for the spiritual path, we don't actually have to 
worry much about others at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can just use every opportunity to show us our blind spots, if you like. Yeah. Cass. Oh, Helen's back as well. We'll come to you, Helen, after Cass. That's a very beautiful way to frame the practice of compassion, actually, to think of it almost as like giving you enough stability, enough of a safe container in which to then look at the blemishes. Because otherwise, like Anna just said, you see all these blemishes and you think, oh my goodness. And if there's any sort of, yeah, ill will towards yourself for that or judgment towards yourself for that, you'll just be overwhelmed. But if we can connect with that compassion, then we can it's much easier to see those blemishes more like guests, more like, yeah, like it says in the suttas in some places, they are like adventitious defilements, like they come and they go, right? They just take advantage. Um, but you have this stability, this, I mean, really, it's just the right intention. It's just the, the path factor of loving kindness and compassion. Yeah, and also letting be, letting go. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Helen, you're back again. Did you want to follow up? I know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think that's also part of this progress of realizing that you have a blemish, you know, realizing that at first you only see the surface, but later you start to see that, of course, it has very deep roots, which is why these things don't go away until, like, anagami, until the third stage of enlightenment. There's, you know, this tendency to always react with liking or disliking. So, and that's, you know, caused by yeah that is anger right I like this I don't like this it's uh it's caused by greed and and hate hatred are the root defilements for that so these things are deep these things are deep but it's amazing to start seeing them because the minute you the thing is if you're seeing it especially if you're seeing it as it's arising um, a part of the mind is not reacting part of the mind is staying with that seeing it you may still be reacting you know, into speech or behaviour, but part of the mind is also, in being aware of it, you're kind of taking responsibility to some extent. And I think... Now... A what? A what reaction? You said you may have a something reaction. I, I just missed the first word. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm really grateful to my first teacher, S.N. Goenka, because he used to say, when you leave the retreat, don't expect that, you know, now you won't react at all. But maybe nine out of ten times you still react the same, but one out of ten you don't. And then it will be eight out of ten times, and then it will be seven out of ten. So not always seeing when we do the mistake, but also seeing when we don't is really important. 
and that can be encouraging because I mean conditioning's deep and it's hard to change so or you might react but the intensity is less or the intensity might be the same but it lasts less long there are all kinds of ways that this awareness starts to kind of interrupt the reaction yeah Good. So we all agree then that it's good to know that we have a blemish. If we have a blemish, it's, it's good to know. We're on the same page. So, <laughs> yeah, so that one was about the person who doesn't know that we put it in a dusty corner. So then he talks about what happens if we do know. Herein, when a person with a blemish understands it as it actually is, I have a blemish in myself, it can be expected that they will arouse zeal, make effort and instigate energy to abandon that blemish and that they will die without lust, hate and delusion. That's good news. Without blemish and with a mind undefiled. Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy, covered with dirt and stains, and they only used it and had it cleaned, and did not not put it in a dusty corner. Would the bronze dish thus get cleaner and brighter later on? Yes, friend. So too, friend, when a person with a blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have a blemish in myself. It can be expected that they will arouse zeal, make effort, and instigate energy to abandon that blemish, and that they will die without lust, hate, and delusion, without blemish, with a mind undefiled. That's good news, isn't it? And it may happen in this life or it may happen in future lives, but if you keep on cleaning that brass, what was it, a brass, a bronze dish, if you keep on cleaning it, you don't put it in a dusty corner. In other words, you don't stop the practice. You don't forget to walk the Eightfold Path in whatever way you can. Sometimes you might be going more slowly. Other times you might have more time to be cleaning that bronze dish but at least it's not in a dusty corner you haven't put away the practice altogether and you keep on getting out that cloth from time to time so even if you only sit in meditation for five minutes a day at that moment you're cleaning off any stains so this is how it gets cleaner and brighter later on Mm. if we already think it's lovely then it stays that way it gets worse (laughs) All right. Shall I continue? Or any any comments? All right. Herein, when a person with no blemish, so this is the no blemish people now. So this is probably either people who've just come out of jhanas or people who are actually enlightened. And of course, you know, this again is different from time to time because if you've just come out of jhana, there'll be times when you are very free of defilement and there'll be times when they come back again right so herein when a person with no blemish does not understand it as it actually is thus i have no blemish in myself it can be expected that they will give attention to the sign of the beautiful and by doing so their lust will affect their mind and they will die with lust hatred and delusion with a blemish with a mind defiled Mm. so that person obviously is not enlightened it's just that there was a time that the mind was pure but they didn't realise it was pure and it says that then they will give attention to the sign of the beautiful so I think what this means here is that you don't really value the fact that you have no blemish. You don't really value that fact or take care to guard it very much. So you're a little bit um, um, neglectful or, what's the word, complacent? You're a bit complacent about protecting the purity of your mind. You don't really realise how rare and how beautiful it is not to have a blemish. You don't really realise that. And so the mind just carries on its old ways. 
Or it seems here in this case that you give attention to the sign of the beautiful. So that is like what we call in the Dhamma a subha, uh, sorry, subha meditation, like seeing only the beautiful. Um, and I think the danger with that is that you're not seeing things clearly, you're not seeing the whole reality because there is... You know, there are things in the world that are beautiful that we can delight in, but there are also things that are, you know, suffering, asubha, um, not attractive. And we have to keep with a balanced mind around that. So let's see what the simile for this one is, because this one's a little bit more tricky to understand. Suppose a bronze dish were bought from a shop or smithy clean and bright, and the owners neither used it nor had it cleaned, but put it in a dusty corner. Would the bronze dish thus get more defiled and more stained later on? Yes, friend. So too, when a person with no blemish does not understand it as it actually is, I have no blemish in myself, it can be expected that they will die, etc., with a mind defiled. Hmm. So you have this beautiful bronze thing, but you don't take care to maintain it, protect it. You take it for granted. And obviously at this point it is still subject to the defilements. You're not fully enlightened. Actually, this is quite common, I have to say. You know, I mean, nowadays when you read about all these modern people, maybe no names mentioned, but anyway, there's quite a lot of them who sort of proclaim enlightenment through this incredible breakthrough moment in their life. Um, and then they go on to be these teachers and people think, oh, they must be enlightened like the Buddha was. But actually, there are so many experiences of temporary purity on the path, you know, of breakthrough moments, whether it's a jhana or a nimitta, that feel incredibly profound. And I think in these kind of cases, that's an example of somebody who feels that their mind is already, in a sense, already without a blemish, or maybe doesn't realise that it is, and then stops the work, you know. They stop the work. It's good enough, right? It's good enough for now. I'm happy enough, so... I stop the work and put it in a dusty corner. What do other people think about that simile? Because that's um, quite an interesting one, isn't it? Any other thoughts or examples on that? So they don't realise they have no blemish in themselves and that's why they don't undertake sense restraint. So again, it's like, I think of sense restraint as like guarding the senses. So it's like, again, you're not really protecting that, that clean brass vessel, right? Or that beautiful, pure mind. Mm. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the way the mind will go, isn't it? If we're not careful, it will always go into looking for those things outside. Yeah. Yes, and maybe they don't realise that there's this purity within, and that's why it gets taken outside. Is that kind of the point there? If you don't realise you have no blemish inside yourself, you're kind of still looking for happiness outside instead of realising that there's all this potential happiness and joy within. And this is kind of a really important part of the path that we have to start appreciating and getting a taste for the the kind of much subtler, purer, um, more contented kind of happiness that arises from inside when the senses are restrained. Mm. I think of this as like, I mean, my sort of weakness in this is that sometimes I'll have a nice meditation and my mind's very nice and happy and pure and bright and... And then I sort of think, okay, now we move into the next thing. And I just move out a little bit quickly, you know, and then don't really guard and preserve that peace. Or it starts coming up like on a long retreat, I start getting a lot of PT. And, and then I sort of take it a bit for granted. Oh, yeah, it'll be there. So now I can do a few more things. And maybe the mind's quite bubbly and quite joyful. And then you're a bit too active. 
and you think, oh, it's okay, I can be active and still sit down and get peaceful. But after a while, it starts to <laughs> you start to wear away the momentum because your mind gets pulled outside. That's what I notice sometimes happening for me. Leah. You can't unmute yourself? I ask, yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, very, very humbling, huh? <laughs> you didn't recognise that you had a, um, not a blemish, but a <laughs> impulse. <laughs> yeah. Great. No, I think it's important because uh, we need to know our triggers. And oh, yeah, they always say, you know, if you think you're enlightened, go home. I know. I know. I fail the test every time, dismally. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You do suffer more initially, or it's like you're more aware of the suffering. But because you're aware, it's almost like I always feel like if I know what the problem is, then I have a chance, you know. I've always been the kind of person that likes to know the truth. And if I know that, then I feel like at least I have a starting point, you know. I'd much rather know than people keep stuff inside or I keep stuff inside or, you know, just not really know the whole scope of the problem. So when I hear the Buddha just saying, you know, that, yes, it is suffering, okay. Okay, the word life isn't there, but he's basically saying everything that we experience is suffering, okay. <laughs> everything through the six senses is suffering. Uh, everything that arises is suffering. Everything that has a cause, that's everything because there's nothing here that didn't have a cause. <laughs> um, i rather know that. I, I feel that's actually a relief, because then it's like, okay, so now we can have a look at what to do about that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 that's really true. It's like when we understand that it is, then we can actually really commit to the path because the only place that we have as refuge is that path. Huh? That path becomes the place that we trust as a place that leads through the suffering, yeah, through and beyond the suffering. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got through two pages now. This is better than Friday night. We only got through like one page. So let's move on. So now it's about the person with no blemish who understands that there's no blemish. So here we go. Herein, when a person with no blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish in myself, it can be expected that they will not give attention to the sign of the beautiful. Okay, so from Derek's uh, um, 
understanding of the Chinese text, that also means they would have some kind of sense restraint going on here. Is that right? Mm. And that by not doing so, in other words, having some sense restraint, lust would not infect their mind and they will die without lust, hate and delusion. I don't know about this lust, hate and delusion. I usually say greed, hatred and delusion or even wanting, hatred and delusion, craving. Greed is normally the translation because it's more than just lust, like a really coarse kind of lust. So they will be expected to die without greed, hate and delusion, without blemish, with a mind undefiled. Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or smithy, clean and bright, and the owners used it and had it cleaned and did not put it in a dusty corner. Would the bronze dish get cleaner and brighter later on? Yes, friend. So too, when a person with no blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish in myself, it can be expected that they will die with a mind undefiled. <clears throat> so yeah, so this kind of makes it clear that we're not talking about an arrow hat here because they still need to be cleaning it. So it's a person with whose mind, and I guess at that time, is without a blemish. So we don't take that for granted. We keep on cleaning, keep on cleaning until we make that a permanent state and we actually overcome all defilements and die without any defilements left at all. So the path continues, yeah? No matter where we are in the stage of purification, the path has to continue. And this is also one of the problems when we think we're you know, further on the path than we are, we sort of stop halfway and don't get the full benefit. And I've seen this so many times with people talking about either jhanas and as just what I would call very light states of just PT in the body. They call it the first jhana already and it's just not. And it's not a matter of, okay, well, our jhanas are deeper than your jhanas and you're not really practicing. That's not the point. The point is that if you take something to be more than it is, then you won't actually get the benefits of the of the real thing. You'll you'll stop halfway. You'll think you've got the benefits. You'll think you've got the the um, you know whatever uh, potential for wisdom to arise or for peace to arise. You'll think that you already have that, and you won't realize that there's so much more to it. There's something much more profound. So in this case, it's very nice. I like this one. Somebody with a pure mind who basically continues to guard the senses, you know, does not get embroiled again in the world, you know, with lust or greed or, but keeps on cleaning that dish. So this is the cause and reason why of these two persons with a blemish, one is called inferior and one is called superior. This is the cause and reason why of these two persons with no blemish, the one is called inferior and one is called superior. So we're all superior because we keep on trying to clean. This is great. And again, it doesn't mean superior in the sense that better than, but just that this is a better path to take. Hmm? This is a path that's going to actually lead to freedom from suffering, freedom from defilements, one and the same. Blemish, blemish is said, friend. But what is this word blemish a term for? Blemish, friend, is a term for the spheres of evil, unwholesome wishes. It is possible that a bhikkhu here might wish. Uh, okay, so now we're looking at blemish in uh, other ways. I mean, I guess it's covering, it's a kind of blanket term for any wish or intention or um, action which is unwholesome. I don't like the word evil. It's more like it's bad in that it leads to suffering. Yeah. It's so anything that leads to that. And then it's going through lots of examples about the kind of blemish that can arise in monastic life. And this is interesting because it also relates to any of us in any lifestyle. Um especially because this is around how we react when people say things that we don't like. And this happens a lot, right? Whether you're in community, whether you're in even living alone, people will still say things you don't like. You'll get on the phone thinking, I'm going to have a nice conversation to cheer me up. And then, you know, the people at the end of the phone are miserable and 
<laughs> not very nice to you or just don't even want to talk to you and so this is quite interesting and this makes it very real so these are all the sneaky things that monastics can the, the ways that the blemishes can arise and uh, make us very sneaky so here we go it is possible that a monastic might wish if I commit an offence let the other monastics not know that I've committed an offence. <laughs> and it is possible that the others come to know that they've committed an offence. And so they become angry and bitter. The monastics now know that I've committed offence. And the anger and the bitterness are both a blemish. <laughs> so that's trying to hide and conceal mistakes. And we read in the Friday Sutta class about uh, the signs of a stream winner. And one of the signs is that they would never cover up a mistake. They would always reveal it. So not that they don't make mistakes, but they would always reveal it. So this is the danger of not revealing it. You get found out and then you get really peeved, let's say. And um, yeah, I suppose the whole lot of that is a blemish. And then they become angry and bitter. The next one. It is possible that a monastic might wish, if I commit an offence, let the other monastics admonish me in private and not in the midst of the Sangha. <laughs> and it is possible that the bhikkhus or bhikkhunis admonish that bhikkhuni in the midst of the Sangha and not in private. So they are anger, angry and bitter thus. Oh, the bhikkhunis admonish me in the midst of the Sangha and not in private. And that anger and bitterness are both a blemish. So this person still has a, quite a strong sense of self or maybe not even a very strong sense of self because most of us don't like being embarrassed but of course that is a sense of self. So this is pointing towards being absolutely transparent mm -hmm. and knowing that by revealing our mistakes it's actually, the Buddha said, a progress on the path. We don't do it for punishment. You know, the Sangha aren't going to get their sticks out and start kind of hitting you and whipping you. It's more the case that, again, we're in line with the reality as it is. Yeah. We're able to say, OK, this is the reality. Today, I, I don't know, what might you have done? You might have taken some food at the wrong time or you might have um, planted something in a pot or cut some flowers or something like this. These are common things, actually, that people do. Or it might be something worse. It might be one of the more... Um, um, I don't know, heavy, I suppose, offences, and you might feel very embarrassed and, and actually uh, not particularly want other people to know. So, and then when they know, you feel angry and bitter. So it is a challenge being in community because, yeah, it does require that humility and that sense of trust. And it, I can just say it's such a blessing to have a teacher who I know well, I would want to tell everything to because I would never want to keep anything away. But also, if I do, I know that I'll be supported and it won't affect the trust or respect on both sides. So, yeah. But, of course, you can apply this in your own lives, I'm sure, right? Have there been times where you've tried to conceal and <laughs> the suffering of that? Okay, then it gets a bit more subtle, so I'll carry on. It is possible that um, a monastic here might wish, if I commit an offence, let a person who is my equal admonish me, not a person who is not my equal. <laughs> and it is possible that a person who is not their equal admonishes them and not a person who is their equal. So he is angry and bitter thus. A person not my equal admonishes me, not a person who is my equal. <laughs> the anger and bitterness are both a blemish. So this is really important for monastics, actually, because we are supposed to be up for scrutiny and, uh, you know, receptive to admonishment also, even from the lay people. So, and, and yeah, I mean, Ajahn Brahm sometimes says don't take it too seriously if it comes from people who don't understand monastic life. But at the same time, you know, it's a real sign, isn't it, if we think, oh... I don't want anyone like my junior or who I perceive as less far on the path telling me what to do. <laughs> what does it really matter? Right? The Venerable Sariputta who's giving this uh, teaching is a beautiful example of someone who doesn't mind. 
because there was one time that he went on arms round and his robe was like not perfectly uh, even at the bottom so you know he used to I think generally monastics look quite elegant and well composed and so he went for this arms round and a little novice monk said to him um, venerable your robe your robe you know he took him to one side and told him his robe was uneven and the venerable Sariputta folded his hands you know in a sign of respect and said thank you my teacher and went and straightened up his robe so this is a beautiful example of how to take that feedback. Thank you, my teacher, whoever you are. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Just reading this makes me feel like, oh, probably because I also have a lot to, a lot of, uh, a lot to relinquish still. It is possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that the teacher might teach the Dhamma to the monastics by asking a series of questions to me, <laughs> not to some other monastic. And it is possible that the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the monastics asking a series of questions to some other monastic and not to that one. So they are angry and bitter thus. The teacher teaches the Dhamma to the monastics by asking a series of questions to some other monastic and not of me. The anger and bitterness of both a blemish. <laughs> jealousy, jealousy. Wanting to be number one in the teacher's eyes. Anyone relate to this? Relating to these things? It can be in any context. Any questions or comments at this point? Shall I keep reading? Are you interested? Good. It is possible that a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni might wish... Oh, that the monastics might enter the village for arms, putting me in the forefront, <laughs> not some other monastic. <laughs> ah, see, we're human beings. Even in the time of the Buddha, they were human beings, right? All these kind of silly things. And it is possible that the monastics enter the village for arms, putting some other monastic in the forefront and not that one. So they are angry and bitter thus. The monastics enter the village for arms, putting some other monastic in the forefront and not me. <laughs> the anger and bitterness are both a blemish. <laughs> it is possible that a monastic here might wish, oh, that I may get the best seat, the best water, the best armed food in the refectory, and not some other monastic. <laughs> How often does that happen? Jake at Gaia House, you think, I better go quickly, I better go first, so that I can get in and get all the best food before it goes cold. Does it happen? <laughs> Uh huh. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I didn't know that he insisted on that. That's so lovely. Because Ajahn Brown does that too. He always tries to think of things to say that he did that was silly. He can't think of many, to be honest, but there are things. Um, just to show that, yeah, he wasn't born enlightened. <laughs> he actually said that once, kind of not realising the irony, because obviously you can't be born enlightened. <laughs> Otherwise you're not born, right? Uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. 
And, and, you know, just to show as well that even though you're ordained, if you still have greed, hatred and delusion, which you will have unless you're an arahat, it will come out in different ways. It can't come out in very worldly ways because there's not a lot of stuff you can do, but it will come out in other ways. So it's not about the object so much. It's more about whatever you can, you know, you'll turn it into... <laughs> you'll make something. You'll make some kind of way for these defilements to be... To manifest because we're so attached to them, it's part of our sense of self. <laughs> Yvonne. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, really uplifting and inspiring and engendering of confidence, isn't it? It really is. And uh, that's one of the main ways that Ajahn Brahm supports me by, because I tell him everything and he knows all my weaknesses as well as my strengths. And he can still say, you're definitely on the path, there's no worry for you at all. And it's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness me. Because I think they're really major things, you know, or like really... <laughs> and he's just like, he has such a bigger context, a bigger perspective on things than, than any of us do. And I mean, it's not just me he's not worried about. He's not worried about anybody who's enjoying their meditation, you know. As long as you can actually sit and meditate and like enjoy your meditation, doesn't mean you're always in jhanas or anything like that. He's not worried about you because he knows that... Also, the virtue, right? If your virtue is strong, he's not worried about you because these are the foundations. And he'll just say to me, um, you know, the causes are there, so the results have to come. Like, it's not about you, it's not about your effort, your capacity, your parami, you know, what you've done in past lives. It's like, if the causes are there, the results have to come. I think the doubt can just arise for me, and maybe for many of us, when we get the factor of time involved because we want it to happen like soon or we want it to happen in this lifetime. But if we can just like let go of that and just throw ourselves in, in a sense, to the path in whatever form, whatever lifestyle, whatever situation we happen to be in, we just still try to incline ourselves to the path. We do what we can. Then we're still making steps on the path. It's that bronze dish again. We're still shining it, you know. Whether we're doing it quickly or not, it's still getting shined up. So yeah, it's really great to hear that these teachers have those kind of uh, struggles too because I can tell you all that when Ajahn Brahm dies I'm going to be on the floor, I just don't know, I'm not beyond that at all, so I think Ajahn Brahm is actually, uh, you know, I don't think someone like Ajahn Brahm is going to even flinch very much, whatever happens, <laughs> but for most of us you know, we still have our attachments and our, the things we invest our happiness in. So, there's about five more minutes of designated time for this sitter class. Shall I read a little bit more? or, or should, Yeah, read a little bit more. I find these really amusing, I have to say. Probably because they are just so human. <laughs> and I have thought some of them before. Yeah. <laughs> Is it, poss oh, it is possible that a monastic here might wish, oh, that I might give the blessing in the refectory after the meal and not some other bhikkhu. And it is possible that some other bhikkhu gives the blessing. Because <laughs> uh, these are all the things that make us feel we still exist. Huh? If you're just in a monastery and no one ever asks you to do anything, you're just the useless monastic, then no, what, what happens to that sense of self? It's really tough. 
you know, and it happens. It happens, for example, like with senior monks, maybe one of them is a brilliant teacher and the other one's quite average and, and the, the one of them just has to watch while the other one just gets all the fame and the, and the credit and the praise. <laughs> That's really hard, isn't it? Because it's not that the other one doesn't have qualities, but they just don't have the same gift. And it isn't actually personal. It's actually the Dhamma just kind of chooses who is going to teach. You know, you're just qualified naturally. Like, each person finds their place somehow. But still, if we've got this sense of self that wants to be a certain something, that can be really tough. It can be really tough. So, next one. Ooh, this is getting into dodgy territory now. It is possible that a monastic here might wish, oh, that I might teach the Dhamma to the other monastics, that I might teach the Dhamma to the bhikkhunis, to the men and the women lay followers visiting the monastery and not some other monastic. And it is possible that some other monastic teaches the Dhamma. (laughs) So you're not in demand. (laughs) And this is important too, because even the idea, I want to teach, can sometimes be coming, well, usually from a sense of self. I mean, of course we want to benefit others and, you know, we want to do the right thing, but still... It's not really up to us to decide. (laughs) Okay, one, one. Okay, I'll finish the the page and then we can say we've done four pages. (laughs) It is possible that a monastic here might wish, oh, that all the fourfold assembly might, that's the bhikkhu, bhikkhunis, men and lay women, and women lay followers, might honour, respect, revere and venerate me and not some other monastic, and it is possible that they honour, respect, revere, and venerate some other monastic. So these are really dodgy areas, aren't they, in monastic life? You know, if you start to feel like it's all about being venerated, then you're kind of losing the point. And I even sometimes just pause if I get emails from people saying, I want to become a nun, I want to become a nun. Because... It's really not about becoming anything. It's not about trading in one identity for another, newer, more improved one. It's actually about letting go of all those identities. Um, and, and actually, when you come to the Dhamma in Asia, that's very obvious, because in Asia there's this idea that there's the lay and the monastic community, or that there are the householders and the samanas. This is still there very deeply, especially in places like India. You know, There's the lay and there's the samanas. And in Burma and Sri Lanka, I'm sure, probably Thailand too, but not, not in as obviously, but it is there too, especially in the forest monasteries. Um, and actually, yeah, the idea is that you disappear into this uh, Samana lifestyle, where you all look the same, you can't be differentiated. And it's a challenge for that reason too, being in the West, because obviously I do look different. I mean, some people, one person, <laughs> a couple of people in my own hometown, actually. The only place I ever got kind of heck, heckled, 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 a um, couple of people, young teenage boys, I was walking into the town with my robe and they said, oh, talk about trying to get attention. <laughs> I actually thought that I'd like shave my head and worn, at that time it was pink robes, to get attention, you know. <laughs> but you can see why they think that over here, because that actually stands out and looks really weird and peculiar. But in Burma it didn't. In Burma I disappeared to a large extent. Mm. <laughs> so wanting respect, wanting honour and praise, this is actually quite dangerous. I actually think these, they start off being quite humble and quite sort of funny but they're starting to get a little bit more dangerous now because uh, yeah especially if you're still thinking this way further up the line you know when you're getting more senior and you're still sort of hankering after that praise and honour it's usually a sign you're not getting a lot of peace in your monastic life and then the next one it is possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that I may be the one to get the superior robe, superior arms food, a superior resting place, superior medicinal requisites, and not some other bhikkhu. And it is possible that some other bhikkhu is the one <laughs> to get superior medicinal requisites, and not that bhikkhu, or bhikkhuni. And so they are angry and bitter thus. Another monastic is the one to get the superior medical requisites, and not me. And the anger and bitterness are both a blemish. 
So there you are meditating and trying to unblemish and then all these things keep arising and blemishing you again. So, and then it says, blemish, friend, is a term for the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes or bad unwholesome wishes. So that's in that context, I guess. You can see that they're about wishing to get things that you haven't got, basically, and then becoming angry and bitter when you don't get them. But this is what craving's like, isn't it? We want something and, you know, we strive for it and we do everything we can and then we, we don't get it. And it can happen even in meditation. We don't think we're craving, we don't think it's that coarse, but then what happens if you sit and you don't feel any more peaceful than you did in the beginning? Do you feel upset? Do you feel disappointed? Do you feel angry even that the path doesn't work and my teacher said it would? I need a better teacher. <laughs> I need a better body, my body hurts, it's because of my tummy that I'm not getting what I want. So, you know, this is the this is the other side of wishes, isn't it? When we have wishes, then our wishes are not fulfilled and then we become angry. And in, of course, the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, that's one of the definitions of suffering, of the cause of suffering. Being separated from what we want, being associated with what we don't want and not having our wishes fulfilled is a cause for suffering. Much better not to have any wishes and to develop contentment. So, I suggest the rest of you later can perhaps complete the sutta. But we've done a lot of it. We've done the heart of it, I would say. And so I hope that was of benefit. There's only actually two and a bit more pages. I mean, if you want, I could just read them out without discussing them. Would you like that? Yeah? Yeah? So I'll just read it straight, it won't take long. If the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in any monastic, then for all they may be a forest dweller, a frequenter of remote abodes, an alms food eater, a house-to-house -house seeker, a, refuge, a refuse rag wearer, a wearer of rough robes, still their fellows in the holy life do not honour, respect, revere or venerate them. Why is that? Because the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in that venerable one. Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy, clean and bright, and the owners put the carcass of a snake or a dog or a human being into it, covering it with another dish, and covering it with another dish went back to the market. Then people seeing it said, what is it you're carrying about like a treasure? And then raising the lid and uncovering it, they looked in, and as soon as they saw, they were inspired with such loathing, repugnance and disgust that even those who were hungry would not want to eat, not to speak of those who were full. <laughs> I think that's quite humorous. So too, if the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in any monastic, then for all they may be a forest dweller, a rag robe wearer, etc., Still, these let's put dot dot dot. These evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in that venerable one. If the spheres of these evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be abandoned in any monastic, then for all they may be a village dweller, an acceptor of invitations, a wearer of robes given to them by householders. Yet their fellows in the house, in the ho sorry, their fellows in the holy life. Honour, respect, revere and venerate them. Why is that? Because the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be abandoned in that venerable one. So there they're comparing somebody who supposedly does all the most uh, austere uh, practices but who still has the defilements with one who doesn't do all those austere practices. They actually live in the village and accept invitations and they live on the outside what you might call a more luxurious life but these wishes these unwholesome states are abandoned and they're the ones worthy of veneration so that's saying it's much more important what's on the inside than how you appear on the outside suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy clean and bright and the owners put clean boiled rice and a variety and various soups and sauces into it and covering it with another dish went back to the market then people seeing it said, what is that you're carrying about like a treasure? Then raising the lid and uncovering it, they looked in, and as soon as they saw, they were inspired with such liking, appetite and relish 
that even those who were full would want to eat, not to speak of those who were hungry. <laughs> so too, friend, if the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be abandoned in any monastic, then no matter how they live, basically, uh, they are seen to be, those, those unwholesome states are abandoned in that venerable one. When this was said, the Venerable Maha Moggallana said to the Venerable Sariputta, A simile occurs to me, friend Sariputta. State it, friend Moggallana. Okay, so then Moggallana says, On one occasion, friend, I was living at the hill fort at Rajagaha. Then, when it was morning, I dressed, and taking my bowl and outer robe, I went into Rajagaha for arms. Now on that occasion, Samiti, the Cartwright's son, was playing a fellow and the Ajivaka Panduputta, son of a former cartwright, was standing by. So that's another ascetic from a different tradition, and I forget which. Then this thought rose in the Ajivaka Pandaputta's mind. Oh, that this Samiti, the cartwright's son, may plane this bend, this twist, this fault, out of the fellow, so that it would be without bends, twists or faults, and come to consist purely of heartwood. And just as this thought came to pass in his mind, so did Samiti, the cartwright's son, plain that bend, that twist, that fault out of the fellow. Then Arjivaka Pandaputta, son of a former cartwright, was glad, and he voiced his gladness thus. He plains just as if he knew my heart with his heart. So he thought he wanted something to happen, and then the other person actually did exactly what he was hoping for. So too, friend, there are persons who are faithless and have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, not out of faith, but seeking a livelihood, who are fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, hollow, haughty, personally vain, rough-tongued, loose-spoken, unguarded in their sense faculties, immoderate in eating, undevoted to wakefulness, unconcerned with recluseship, not greatly respectful of training, Luxurious, careless, leaders in backsliding, neglectful of seclusion, lazy, wanting in energy, <laughs> unmindful, not fully aware, unconcentrated and straying, with straying minds, devoid of wisdom, drivelers. <laughs> the Venerable Sariputta, with his discourse on the Dhamma, planes out their faults, just as if he knew my heart with his heart. <laughs> so I don't know if Anna has such a long list of blemishes, but there was a really, really long list of blemishes, huh? <laughs> that you can have as a monastic or anyone else. <laughs> Excellent. You're doing well. <laughs> okay. So this is praise now for the Venerable Sariputta's ability to speak about the Dhamma in a way that yeah, over, helps people overcome their faults, just as if he knew what was in their mind and exactly the medicine that was needed. So this is the praise. But there are clans people who have gone forth out of faith from home life into homelessness who are not fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, haughty, hollow, etc. Who are guarded in their sense faculties, moderate in eating, devoted to wakefulness, concerned with recluseship, greatly respectful of training, not luxurious or careless, who are keen to avoid backsliding, who are leaders in seclusion, energetic, resolute, established in mindfulness, fully aware, concentrated, with unified minds, possessing wisdom, not drivelers. These, on hearing the Venerable Sariputta's discourse on the Dhamma, drink it in, eat it, as it were, eat it as it were, by word and by thought. Good indeed is that he makes his fellows in the holy life or in the spiritual path emerge from the unwholesome and establish themselves in the wholesome. Did you drink it in? Take it in? Eat it in? So this is meant for you. Just as a woman or a man, young, youthful, fond of adornments, with head bathed, Having received a garland of lotuses, jasmine or roses, would take it in both hands and place it on the head. So too there are clansmen who have gone forth out of faith, who are blah blah blah, not drivelers. All those good things. These, on hearing the Venerable Sariputta's discourse on the Dhamma, 
drink it in and eat it, as it were, by word and thought. Good indeed it is that this that he, Sariputta, makes his fellows in the holy life or on the spiritual path emerge from the unwholesome and establish themselves in the wholesome. Thus it was that these two great beings rejoiced in each other's good words. <laughs> Very nice, isn't it? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent. And the fact that you enjoyed that and drank it in, you see, shows that you're actually on the side of the people with all those positive qualities. Because if you didn't have those qualities, you wouldn't be so open and receptive and delighting in the Dhamma. So sometimes we think we're on one side because of our fault finding and negativity towards ourselves. But actually, we're, we're well and truly on the path. So thank you very much. And uh...